we will be discussing wrapping and bandaging today. I'll talk about stall wraps, and I'll call them stall wraps. We'll touch on polo wraps. And the reason we'll be talking about that is because the technique used for these is essentially identical with some modifications to placing veterinary bandages. So this is the hawk of a horse and it's got some vet wrap over top of some padding material and they've left the point of the hawk exposed there so that the horse can still move the hawk without getting a pressure sore. I call them tools. The materials we're going to use, I call them tools because it implies that we can have problems if tools are misused. So that's what I talk about, them, um, the uses for that, and then how do we put them on. There's all kinds of different things, and I actually brought some along. I'm sure many of you are uh, familiar with the various types of cottons that we can have. The first ones that we're seeing there are the so-called no-bows. And they have a foam core, sorry, it's shaking because I've got this bag in my hand. Um, they have a foam core and then fleece on the outside. And then we have other types of cottons, which are the quilted ones in the middle and less quilted ones, but there's still that type of cotton. And then there's this one on the end, and this is a cotton sheet. These ones can be washed and should be washed and they can be reused. These ones are generally a single use and are not my favorite if I'm doing a stall wrap. And then we have the outside of that, which is the actual bandage itself. And these ones here, I don't have an example of. They are not my favorite, especially for novice wrappers. They're silky, slippery, they're wide. If you're good at this, they're, they're great. They look very nice when you're done, but uh, they're not my favorite. Uh, if you want practice with doing this, I like these kind better, and these are actually a couple of pictures I've taken myself of these ones. They're, they have a woven texture that you can see at the bottom there, and they have a bit more grip when you're trying to put them on, so they can be easier for you to manage as a novice bandage wrapper. And then finally, we have the polos, the thickest of all. Of course, they're used when you're working the horse to protect them from knocking their legs together, or if they knock their legs together, it gives them a little added protection. They're very poofy, squishy, they're fleece, and you can use them to practice your bandaging techniques because they have the most grip of all. So they're good to use for practice. So why do we use stall wraps? It's to prevent lower limb edema. So if you've ever looked at your horse, they may have so-called wind puffs at the back of the leg there, and they may also have stocking up, as it's called. The best way of preventing that stuff is to keep the horse moving. But since we like to have our conveniences of keeping horses confined rather than being out walking around like they should be doing, uh, this will happen. And we do wrap our horses to prevent that. Using stall wraps inappropriately or having them miswrapped can cause far more problems than you're trying to fix. And we do it for support for the opposite leg. And so this horse has a cast placed all over here. And then in order to support this leg over here, they've put a bandage around that. And one of the best things about the lower limb wrap is if you put one here, you can keep the knee bandage on better and you can keep the hawk bandage on when you're doing the actual veterinary type bandage if you've got a wound over the knee or the hawk. And it's also handy to to keep an injured area clean. So we always want to ensure that the bandage is rolled correctly. I know this seems basic, but when I first started coming around the track, I would roll the bandage backwards, and you should have heard them swear at me. <laughs> um, because they're crouched down there, and they're trying to get everything done, and they come to the end, and they can't get the Velcro to attach because it's backwards. So the easiest way that I do it is to make the Velcro meet and then just keep rolling in the direction of that Velcro to keep that Velcro hidden essentially in the middle of the bandage. We always want to remember a few things. There are some rules about this. You want the leg to be dry. You want it to be clean because if you wrap dirt in there, you can cause a pressure sore from the dirt getting ground into the leg, into the skin, and that can cause wounds. And you want the hair to be smooth as well for the same reason. You don't want it to be um, causing problems underneath that bandage. So clean cottons are very important. You don't want them to be gunked up or dirty. 
just the same as having dirt on the leg itself. And we always want to remember our personal safety. No kneeling beside the horse. I'm too old to do that anymore anyway, but uh, I sort of crouch in an awkward manner. Uh, but you always want to be able to dive out of the way if the horse acts up, rears up, or does anything bad. We always want to start and end over the cannon bone if possible, or at the uh, inside or outside aspect of the leg. Sometimes it happens to end up there. And that's because if you start and stop over the tendon, you have more of a chance of irritating the skin, soft tissue below that, and so-called cording the horse. I've got a picture of that in a moment. We put this uh, first, the nobo, or the other cotton, just below the knee or just below the hock and we end over the fetlock so we cover the fetlock to protect that as well and when we place the bandage on the outside we overlap by 50 percent so i'll show that in a moment we want to have about a half inch of cotton showing at the top or the bottom and that's because this bandage will have a tendency if it's over the top to become tight and that will constrict the tissues under there, and then that causes problems as well with cording or bandage wounds that way. You don't always want too much more than a half an inch because the horse, if they're fractious in their stall, will start pulling at that, and then they start pulling at that, and the bandage gets ruined, and then you cause pressure sores from that. Here's some pictures off the web. I think this is Canadian horse and rider. They're, they're excellent pictures. So this is the cotton, this is the back, this is the horse's hind limb there. And you can see that's the hock, that's the fetlock, and the bandages. Some people get fancy and start sliding that bandage in there. Don't start that way, you can do that later. Uh, and then wrapping, they've, they know the length of the cannon bone, so they know they start down there. And you can see she's overlapping by 50%. She does, I will say, have too much tension on that bandage. If you stretch them, you can see they've got a bit of stretch to them, but you don't ever want to stretch that maximally. We'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. I would say she's got way too much tension on that. Some people, especially pony club type groups, like to have a little V shape here. They say it helps with the fetlock moving like that. I would say that it helps the horse have access to that bandage. But uh, anyway, that's a personal preference. Everybody has their own way of doing things. The main thing is tension must be even up and down the leg. It must, not be, it must be snug, but not too tight. And then this is the finished product. So very nice. We can see even contours up and down both sides. Uh, again, I would argue it's a bit too tight. So. Cannon bones have different lengths. Here we have a picture of Jack-Jack. This is a mini mule, and um, that's his dam, and this is Jack-Jack. You can see he looks like a donkey. And uh, so his mom and, and he have very tiny little cannon bones, so you're going to wrap them differently than you are the Percheron on the other side. What you'll do when you're starting out, you'll have to do a lot of practice runs with this and try not to get frustrated with yourselves and, and just until you get comfortable with it. So that's why I say don't start with those slippery bandages to begin with because it makes it harder. Tension, like I say, never fully stretch the wrap. We just want a little bit of tension, enough to hold it up so that if the horse goes and runs around a little bit, it's not going to slide down. Even pressure over the entire length, no, no dips and dives and should have an even contour when you look at it, like a stovepipe. Probably like the leg underneath it is a stovepipe. <laughs> um, like I say, I keep saying this because I can't emphasize it enough. Not too tight, even pressure over the entire length, because this is the result of a bandage wound. So they either, well, we'll talk about that in a sec, either too much pressure in that spot or um, something else happened. This one's a little more subtle. This is a so-called cord. It's actually hasn't damaged the tendon itself. It's damaged the soft tissues and uh, skin over top of it. Uh, other people will call it a bandage bow. That's not really a true full uh, damage to the tendon, which would be a bow. So we can see it outlined here in red. The other thing we don't want it too loose is because just like the leg warmers on this ballet dancer, um, they'll slide down 
and then the bandage is over top of that. So you're creating lumps and bumps inside of there and you're promoting either this or this ulcer here to form. So this is a hawk bandage, not a complete hawk bandage. They would have put tape on there to hold it up and they probably would have put a stall wrap underneath it to help it stay up as well. This is a strange little bandage on a, probably a scratch on the middle of the cannon bone. And here is one that is trying to immobilize this knee or carpus a little bit more. But this is what the veterinary bandage looks like. We want it first and foremost if there's an active bleed to stop the bleeding. We want it in place to soak up pus and other dirt and debris. And we also want to protect the wound from dirt. They're standing in manure. They're in a paddock with dirt. Soil is going to, manure is going to get down the top of the bandage, up the bottom of the bandage. And if that gets into the wound, then it gets infected. Drying equals dead. And you can't suture dead. So reduce swelling around that wound. Ice and cold water therapy, this is another way applying pressure on that bandage to reduce swelling. Because again, if you have swelling in that wound, it's going to expand and pull the edges of that farther apart. And then to keep the wound in the leg from moving, because every time that horse flexes its knee or its carpus, it's putting tension on that skin. And even if I've placed really nice sutures and it started out closed nicely, uh, if that is moving like that, it's going to rip those sutures right out. So the first layer of the basic bandage is a non-stick type dressing, preferably, especially in the first aid situation. You don't want to start getting anything stuck in there more than is already stuck in there before the uh, vet comes to you. The second layer is a padding layer. And that helps to cushion the area. So if it um, has a chance of knocking against another object, like the other limb, it helps to cushion the area. And it absorbs pus and serum and other exudates coming from that wound to help that wound heal and get it out of the wound, very importantly. And then you can use sheet cotton. You can also buy roll cotton. And you can use cast padding as well, so long as it's a cotton kind of blend, rather probably than the synthetic variety. And the final layer is the actual bandage part of it. And that is self-adhesive elastic wrap, otherwise known as vet wrap, or covidian, which is this stuff here. It's a little more sticky, so you put that on as the last roll. And the purpose of the final layer, the bandage layer, is to hold all the other pieces in place to keep them from slipping down, to keep them protecting and helping that wound to heal. And they can also be used when specifically applied for this purpose to apply pressure to that wound and to keep it from swelling too much. Another tool you can use is conforming or stretch gauze, cling sometimes it's called. And it's used, it looks like this, and it's kind of a spider webby type material. It does have some stretch to it. You don't want to stretch it out though. You just want to place it around. And that is used in this case to hold that primary layer down, the first layer of the bandage, the dressing. And then you put the padding layer over top of that. The tape is the final part of this bandage to hold everything in place because it's going to have a natural tendency to slip down or to move as the horse's leg moves. So you can use elasticon or tensoplast, and it is a sticky bandage material. And you can also use, of course, masking tape or duct tape. Uh, I prefer this stuff. It's got a bit of stretch to it. So when the horse's muscles flex, it, it flexes and moves along with that a bit better. But of course, in the first aid situation, these two work just fine. Bandages with tape, we already talked about that one, and then this one we talked about a little bit as well. So they're trying to keep that carpus or knee from flexing, and so they've put quite a long bandage on, and they've secured it top and bottom so that it doesn't slip down and, and dirt and debris doesn't get in the top either and helps it to stay in place. So additional tools, of course, you'll want to be wearing gloves whenever you're, when you're handling any sort of bloody or dirty tissue. You don't want to get that on yourself and you also don't want to get any junk from you into that wound 
and paramedic scissors, blunt end scissors or accident victim cutting off the clothes scissors are um, important to have as well. Because if you need to get any one of these off fast, you're not unwrapping this. You're using those scissors and going down the side and cutting carefully. So the blunt end will prevent you from actually cutting the horse as you're doing that.